Oh, by the way, ushers, <laughs> I said the collection bags are underneath the table where Tom's sitting. <laughs> we sw we uh, stole a table for decorating. <laughs> okay, our reading today is Matthew chapter 4, verses 23, is that right? Okay, 23 through 5 through 1. <clears throat> And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse disease and torment, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatics. <coughs> I had to laugh about that when I read it over. Because <clears throat> there's a lot of us that's included in that. And those <clears throat> that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Let's pray together. Father, it's a joyful time of year. As we remember your son's return, Father, like we did last week, and we remember how he's come in the past, Father, I'm overwhelmed with your grace, with the, the mercy that you've shown us and the, the love that you've demonstrated, wanting, wanting us to be where you are so much that you were willing to go to that length to make it happen. Father, I thank you that we have the privilege of celebrating Jesus' coming. I thank you that we have the privilege at this time of year to share his coming. And I pray that you will give us fruit as we share what we know of you, and what we've experienced of you. I pray, Father, that as this church does its ministry, things like the cantata, things like the candlelight service, things like the, the Christmas caroling, that, that your love will show through the same way it showed through Jesus lying in that manger. The people will come to faith in, in him instead of all the things we falsely put our faith in. I ask you, Father, to hear our prayers and grant them according to your perfect wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
That was beautiful. Um, let me look around here just a moment here. You all get to spend all your time looking at me. It's my turn to look back. Uh, we'll go ahead at this point and dismiss the kids for Children's Church. And while they're going out, I will smile. Some of them were waving at me. Isn't that awesome? That's great. Um, let's pray and ask the Lord to guide us as we look into His Word today. So, Father, um, I'm so thankful for my Savior. I'm thankful that He is the King of the world. I'm thankful that He is so gracious and so present with us. I ask what's offered here today will be glorifying to Him. I pray that your spirit will take over and speak to each one of us in the privacy of our heart and help us to be encouraged that Jesus Christ is on our side and that he has greater things planned for us than we could ever ask or imagine. Father, help us to find our joy this Christmas season in the Savior that came and in the Savior that will come. In Jesus' name, amen. Look who's coming. That's the name of the series that we're in. I started this last week. It's essentially a, an Advent series. We are in the Advent season on the Christian calendar right now. And we're celebrating his past coming. But last week I started the series by looking at his future coming when he returns as the king. That one's not working. We're trying to get it working, but it's not working this morning. I apologize for the inconvenience. Um... Yes, last week we talked about the, uh, the coming of Jesus in the future. This week I want to look at Jesus as the healer. The Jesus that came in at Bethlehem is our healer. I want to look this week at how he has come to redeem us from the product of our sin. And hopefully when I get done you'll understand what I mean by the product of our sin. We are going to be in Matthew, where Cynthia was reading just a little while ago, and I will uh, explain as we go how this all works together. Um, when we get to Matthew chapter 4, it's, it's difficult to realize this unless you've read the other Gospels, but we're actually jumping in uh, between the first and the second year of Jesus' ministry. Most scholars will separate Jesus' ministry into three years. The first year is called the year of obscurity. That's as he's building his ministry and building his ministry team and becoming better known. The second year is the year of popularity, where most people liked Jesus and things were pretty much going his way. The third year was the year of resistance. That's when the Pharisees and the other religious leaders started to get upset with Jesus and started to make life trouble for him. And then, of course, the last week is the Passion Week that we talk about near Easter. As we come to this passage today, we're, we're entering that second year where Jesus is popular and there's a lot of people that know who he is and a lot of people that want to see him. And Jesus is at that point where he is in jeopardy of what is called today the success syndrome. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but when we speak of the success syndrome, we speak of being so successful at something that it distracts us from the main thing. Uh, a good church illustration of that is the nursery. Typically, in a small to mid-sized church, someone will volunteer for the nursery, and they love the kids, and they want to be involved with the kids' ministry, so they, they're there every time the church needs a nursery, and the church begins to expect that the nursery will be open. And so things like we did yesterday when we decorated the church, they would advertise that the nursery would be available. So if you have kids, you could come and put your kids in the nursery and participate in decorating the church. Guess who doesn't get the opportunity to decorate the church? The person who works in the nursery. When we have the cantata, they would advertise the nursery is available, and the nursery worker doesn't get to participate in the cantata. When we have the candlelight service, again, the nursery would be open. She's the only person who can run the nursery. She's the only person willing. She's so successful at running the nursery, she doesn't get to participate in all the other things that happen in the church. 
that happens in our culture. It was a temptation for Jesus because his healing ministry was becoming so successful. We have a problem with that in our current environment. I don't know if you know this. I'm kind of a statistic nut. I think of statistics as a study of the way God normally works. And right now, as you look at the churches in the United States today, the median church, that means half the churches have more people, half the churches have less people. The median number of people in a church today is 75 in the United States. So if you've got one of those smaller churches, frequently more people have to do more things. You take that with the other statistic that is shifting right now in culture, where it used to be that 20% of the people in the church did 80% of the volunteer work. Now they're finding that it's closer to 10% of the people in the church have to do 80% of the volunteer work. Those people that are willing to volunteer get overwhelmed. And frequently, as a leader in the church, I have to look at someone and say, are they in danger of being burned out? And being so exhausted that they can't be benefited by the ministry of the church. Simply because they are good at what they do. Jesus was in jeopardy of that as well. Jesus was um, traveling through Galilee and collecting disciples. And as he would collect disciples, if you look at the first verse here in Matthew, um, it's Matthew 4, 23. It says, he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. First thing I notice in that verse is that Jesus' ministry always involved healing. Part of that is because of the way the Jews saw disease. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit here. But one of the things that I notice here is that Matthew listed healing last. He talked about teaching first. Jesus went from city to city and village to village in Galilee to the synagogue and he would sit down to teach. And as he was teaching, he would proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. If you look earlier, I think it's verse 17 in chapter 4, uh, Matthew gives us the summary of what that gospel is. It's repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's telling them to, to rethink what they've made priorities in their life in the past because something's about to change. The kingdom is coming. That means the king is close by. And when he arrives... Everything's going to change. And you may need to reevaluate what you've put your faith in, what kind of practices you've had, the things that you thought brought you security. And those were the important things that Jesus was teaching. But when he was sitting in the synagogue, he would look over to the side and he would see someone with a withered hand and he would have mercy on him and heal his hand or somebody with leprosy and he would touch them and heal their leprosy, or someone would be a, a deaf mute, and he would touch them, and they would begin to speak and hear again. And that news got out. It said that it went all over Syria. Verse 24, his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick. That's a lot of sick people. All the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. The way Matthew presents that is Jesus never saw a sick person that he didn't heal. And these healings began to attract a lot of attention, so much so that people from Syria, now I, I don't know if you're aware of the reputation the Syrians had. Syria was north of the Holy Land, and it was primarily peopled with Greeks. If you remember, uh, Alexander the Great had conquered that whole, that whole part of the world earlier, and the Greeks had ruled in the Syrian area, and they had established a temple there for the Greek god Pan. Now, you probably don't know this, but Pan was the god of chaos. He was the god of mischief. 
And so they would celebrate by creating chaos and mischief everywhere they could as they worshiped Pan. And that was the reputation that the Syrians had. But they, were, they had all these sick people and they would come to Jesus and even those people he would heal. To the point that it became popular enough that it dominated everything that he taught. Now before we go too much further, it's important that we understand how the Jews saw sickness. The Jews were, were very affected, and, and rightly so, by the teachings of the old, what we call the Old Testament, their Torah. And they would see someone who was sick, and the first thing that would come to their mind was what we call Genesis chapter 3. They didn't have chapters at the time, but they thought about the fall of the human race. Because God had told them that they could eat of any of the fruit in the garden, but if they ate from this particular tree, the knowledge of good and evil that they would surely die. And so they connected death with the ultimate penalty for sin. And they saw sickness as God's accelerating the dying process. So someone who was sick was obviously under God's curse and separated from God because Either they or someone else had done something horribly wrong and God had put them under a special kind of curse by giving them an affliction. And when Jesus began to heal those people, he wasn't just restoring them to physical health. He wasn't just relieving their ailments. He was restoring their relationship with God. He was reversing the curse. And as he continued to try to teach, and more and more sick people came. They began to come from even more places. Verse 25 says, and great crowds, whatever a great crowd is to Matthew, we're not sure, but great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. He's managed to include everything that would have been in the greatest geographical expanse of Israel from the Old Testament. Everything from both sides of the Jordan, what we would call the Holy Land, the Promised Land. And these people are coming. And they're coming to be healed. They're coming because Jesus is the healer. And if you, if you read carefully in some of the other Gospels, a couple of times, it's not real common, but a couple of times, Jesus is even referred to as that healer by his adversaries. Jesus is in real jeopardy here of the success syndrome where he's so successful as a healer that the teaching and the proclamation of the kingdom of God might be in jeopardy. And so he takes action to correct that. I'd encourage you not to, or to, to challenge the habit of stopping a reading right at the chapter breaks. Because in this case, we miss something if we stop right at the end of chapter 4 and we don't get the first couple of verses of chapter 5. Because it says, chapter 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds. I have to stop right there. I don't know why. But the, I use the English Standard Version. I like it. It's a really easy to study out of. But for some reason, they chose not to translate one of the words in that phrase. In Greek, there is a, uh, a duh in there. We would spell it D-E-H. And that's a conjunction that connects that verse with what was before it in contrast. Some of you, uh, if you read the New International Version or the King James Version, it will say, and then or, or later Jesus saw. But the, the word is most often translated but. So it would read, that, if we read it that way, at the end of, Verse 25, we would say, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan, but seeing the crowd, Jesus is going to take action here. He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. I didn't see this until this week. Jesus is pictured as being at the, at the base of a mountain with this great crowd of, of 
multi-ethnic, multi, probably multi-generational, uh, very commonly sick people, debilitated people at the base of the mountain. And Jesus is seeing that they're only here for the healing, or they're primarily here for the healing. And so he chooses to go up a mountain. Can you imagine what going up a mountain is like for somebody who has, uh, is a paralytic or has epilepsy? Or someone who's a diabetic? And I just noticed this, that he is going up the mountain to separate himself from the crowd. He doesn't want the healing, the success of his healing, to overshadow his teaching ministry. And so he goes up on the, on the mountain and sits down. That's the, way the G, that's the way the Jews would say, gets ready to teach. Because all their teachers sat. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Just the people he's called to teach. And he goes on to teach what may be the greatest sermon in the history of the world. The Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has set us an example here that we need to be very careful to follow. Jesus has set us an example of keeping the main thing the main thing. Even if that means abandoning what might have been considered success. You see, the healings were easy to measure. You could see a sick person come to Jesus and walk away well. If, you, if a person came to Jesus blind and walked away without his walking stick, you knew he could see. If a person came with a, a bad leg and walked away without a crutch, you knew Jesus had successfully healed them. And that idea of success was leaking into his ministry. So much so that he was attracting great crowds. But he was not going to let the world's definition of success control the ministry that he was just beginning to be known for. Jesus didn't let the distractions of numerical success overshadow a deeper success. We need to be careful of that too. Because we can be distracted by what we think of as success. What our society recognizes as success. I think the most common um, emblem or, or image of success we have in the United States is leisure time. A person who's successful has the freedom, the free time, to go out to dinner. Has the free time to go to a movie or a ball game. Because they've been successful enough that they can walk away from their work. And have that leisure time. Another one is control. If you watch social media, and I probably watch it too much, but if you watch social media, just watch how people are trying to control the people around them. That you know, they, they whine, they bellyache, they accuse, they raise their voice. It's all to control other people's thoughts. Money is another success. We uh, live in a capitalistic society, and in capitalism, the whole idea is make as much money as you can. So the guy who makes the most money is obviously the one who's been the most successful. Sometimes that can get in our way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Popularity is another one that we strive for. Again, social media. If you watch social media or you have any friends, especially younger friends, uh, in social media. Uh, I walked up to a young lady one time. She was just bawling her eyes out. I said, what's wrong? How can I help? Something, something's obviously shattered your world. She looked up at me and says, I posted a post on Facebook 10 minutes ago and nobody's liked it yet. That's, that's a distraction from what's really important. Whatever other definition of success we have, if it distracts us from Jesus, it's not true success. Notice even in our passage what true success seems to be. See, when we go back to the way the Jews thought that disease 
or affliction of some kind was a sign that you were under some special kind of curse from God because it was an extension of the death curse that all human race, all the human race came under. Then what's really happening here is that it's not just a health issue, it's a relationship issue. In the Jewish way of thinking, in the, in the biblical way of thinking, even in the New Testament, death is not like we think of it in the 21st century. Many of us have been raised to think of death as you live your life, you get to the end of your life, your body dies, and that's where it stops. But did you notice that when Adam ate the fruit, he still lived for almost a thousand years? What kind of death did he have? He had a relationship death. Have you ever heard someone say of their child or their some other family member, they're dead to me? We have no relationship with them. It's as if they're dead. But when Jesus came to bring healing, he came to heal everything, not just the physical ailment. He came to reestablish the relationship with God the Father. And you can pick that out in chapter 5, verse 1. As Jesus goes up the mountain, those close to him, those who have a close relationship with him, his disciples come to him and he teaches them. See, as Jesus' ministry of healing became a danger to um, the true ministry that he had, he turned back to the relationship issues to build a close relationship with each one of us. Now, if we focus on our relationship with Jesus like this, we have a, a, several benefits that come from that. First, it will correct our relationship, our distractions in our relationship with Him. As we build a relationship stronger with Him, then all those distractions, the, the football game, the sleeping in late, the, the overtime at work, lose their priority so that we can have a relationship with Him. It will help us keep our enthusiasm for that relationship. When people come to me and say, Pastor, I tried to read the Bible, but it's just so dry. I ask them about their relationship with Jesus. Because if you really foc are focusing on that relationship. See, so many people read the Bible for what they can get out of it today. It just doesn't help me today. Well, does your relationship with your parents help you today? Maybe, maybe not. Does your relationship with your grown kids affect you today? It should a little bit, but it's the same with our relationship with, with God. We need to work at it. We need to build at it. And if we are focusing on that relationship instead of some tidbit that will make my job better or some, some grain of truth that will let me win an argument somewhere, that's a pretty dry relationship. But a, a vibrant, life-giving relationship with Jesus will keep our enthusiasm up. It will also help us keep our joy in that relationship. One of the most, you may not know this, but uh, you can actually measure joy. Um, psychiatrists do it all the time. And the most joyless season of the year is right now. More people go into the hospital with depression and despondency during the month of December than any other month of the year. The stress, the, the anxiety, the, the pressure gets to people. But let's put our relationship with Jesus first and see if that doesn't defend our joy. And there is one other alternative, something else that needs to be considered here. Perhaps if your relationship seems dry and distant and even non-existent, there is the possibility that that's the truth that you've never really seen Jesus as someone to have a relationship with instead of somebody to bless your life. 
Jesus isn't someone that you come to and sprinkle a little bit of him on top of your life right now and expect it to become perfect. Jesus is someone you come to abandoning everything else that you put your trust in. Rejecting all of the concepts of success, the money, the popularity, the power. Because all of that ends eventually. The older we get, the more we realize that we're getting close to that ending. Because that day when our bodies stop functioning and our spirit has to continue without our body, on that day, all of those other ideas of success stop. And the only form of success is your relationship with Jesus. I talked a little bit about it last week already, how when we stand before Jesus right after our bodies stop functioning and we're standing there and and about to find out where we're going to spend eternity. There's only two choices. Where Jesus is and the place meant for people who follow Jesus and where Satan is and the place meant to give Satan the reward for his rebellion against God. We have to make that choice. And God has ordained that that choice not be makeable at that point. We have to make it before that. We have to decide while we're still in the body what our real understanding of success is going to be. Is it going to be what everybody else can see? Or is it going to be a relationship with Jesus Christ? I hope no one leaves here this morning with that relationship in doubt. If that's something that you have questions about, you can ask me. You can ask one of the deacons. We'd be honored to try to help you find those answers so that you can know for sure, regardless of what happens on this earth, your next life is going to be where Jesus is. See, Jesus was born. His first advent was to bring relief from the illnesses and the dysfunctions and the diseases that we have in our bodies, but also from the dysfunctional relationship we have with his father. He has actually come to remove the product of sin in our life for eternity. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you that Jesus has come. I thank you that as he has come, he has given us hope for the future. And that when we leave this world, we will have a pleasant place to go, a place that honors you and benefits us. I thank you that Jesus has come to begin that process now as we stop trusting in the wrong things and start trusting in his work on the cross. Father, we can begin building that relationship that will last for eternity with you. Father, it's it's such a simple concept, your grace, that you're going to give us something simply for trusting you to give it to us. It's so simple that we tend to think it's too good to be true. But Father, if your purpose on this earth is to demonstrate your grace, then the more we don't deserve it, the more gracious you are giving it to us, and you get even more glory. And I ask you, confirm in each person's heart in this room that they have started that relationship with you, that it will affect every aspect of their life. Help all of us to grow and become more like Jesus as the Spirit Jesus has sent sanctifies us. Father, if there's anyone in our lives, either whether they're in this room or in our family or in our co-workers who is not saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will use us to deliver that message in a clear and understandable way. 
that they would receive that gift, the greatest gift of all, our redemption. I offer you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.